For almost as long as we've had iPhones and Android phones, there's been Samsung versus Apple. And for 2021, both manufacturers launched big powerhouses of a device with spec sheets that'll make any tech fan drool. Apple launched the iPhone 13 Pro Max and Samsung launched the Galaxy S21 Ultra. So which should you buy? I'm Cam Bunton from PocketLint and hopefully I'll help you decide in this video. And while you're here, if you could tap like, the subscribe and the notification bell, that would be lovely. In recent years, Samsung and Apple have taken quite different approaches to design and aesthetics with their flagship smartphones. Or at least as different as it can be when you're designing a glass rectangle. The only real similarity here is that they're both made from glass and metal, but even here, Apple has gone with a surgical grade stainless steel, while Samsung has aluminium. Now what's interesting is that although the Samsung phone is taller and noticeably thicker than the iPhone, it's also lighter, and it's slightly narrower and features curves on the back. That means it has a better, more comfortable one-hand feel than the sleek and flat iPhone. The curves on the edges are only subtle, but they do make it a nicer device to hold there aren't as many sharp corners. Where Apple has a bit of an edge is in the precision of some of its design elements, like looking at the camera housing which seamlessly curves up from the glass on the back. Samsung's almost has that seamless appearance too, and it wraps around the edges, but there are very tiny lines that ever so slightly ruin that illusion. It's a similar story on the front, where Apple has a uniform bezel thickness all the way around the display, and even matches the curve of the external corners with the bezel. Samsung's doesn't do that, but then, thanks to having a curved screen, its bezel up the sides does appear much thinner, giving it a more edge-to-edge -edge feel to it. What's more, there's only one tiny camera punching through the panel at the top, which doesn't obstruct anywhere near as much as the notch that Apple has, even though they made it smaller this year. Still, that notch serves a purpose. Face ID is still very convenient and an intuitive way to unlock your phone. You just have to pick it up and look at it, and it's unlocked. In a modern world where we need to wear face masks though, it's not always the most convenient. At least not when trying to authenticate payments. Samsung uses an in-display ultrasonic fingerprint sensor for this, which works really well most of the time, and can be used even if your face is entirely covered with a balaclava. As for dust and water resistance, both have the same IP68 rating, so they'll survive pretty much everything. Although Samsung's is only tested to a meter and a half depth, while Apple claims it can survive down to six meters for 30 minutes. Now, when it comes to displays, it's safe to say that these two phones are fairly evenly matched, despite what the spec sheets might lead you to believe. There are differences, but I wouldn't say enough to make one worth picking over the other. For instance, Samsung's is larger, and ever so slightly sharper in terms of pixel density, but when you're watching the iPhone next to the Samsung set to its natural mode, it can be a little tricky to spot any significant differences. To our eyes, what we'd say is that most of the time, with both cranked to full brightness, the iPhone has the general overall brighter panel, even if Samsung's can technically reach a higher peak brightness. Watching videos and movies on various services, whether it's Netflix or Disney Plus or YouTube, it also appears to have a bit more contrast, which actually means that at times it can look a bit artificially sharp compared to Samsung's. The Samsung would often make the video look a little softer and more natural. Of course, if you set the Samsung to its vivid mode, the story is entirely different. It boosts all the colors way too much, but if you like it, the option is there. Both even feature the same 120Hz screen refresh rates, and for the most part, you only really see that super smooth animation when you're scrolling around in the general user interface, and scrolling up and down things like the settings menu or dropping down notifications. It's not something that makes a massive difference to movie watching. They even both have their own ambient color matching technology to reduce blue light on the screen and match the temperature to the light around you. Usually that means making the screen a tiny bit warmer. Now if there's one place where it doesn't make any sense at all to compare specifications, it's in performance and battery life. Because both have very different operating systems and iOS is, by and large, far more efficient than Android in general usage. So it doesn't need all the additional RAM or mega battery capacities that we see on Android phones. As speed and fluidity go, the two phones are quite similar. Both are fast and responsive, loading games and apps quickly. That's despite Samsung's chipset having two additional processor cores. In Europe, it's the top tier Exynos processor versus Apple's A15 Bionic chip, which outscores pretty much every other smartphone in Geekbench tests. Side by side, the iPhone did appear to load most games and apps faster than the Samsung, but there was never more than a second in it. Often less. It's a very tiny margin. 
Apple doesn't reveal battery capacities officially, but the iPhone features around 4,300 milliamp hours and is significantly smaller than the Samsung's 5,000. Still, in our testing, it can easily outlast the Samsung. Even for me, with my moderate usage, which usually involves about three or four hours screen time a day, the iPhone can usually make it to the end of a second day without too much effort. Samsung's doesn't ever make it through two days for me, but by the end of the first day, I'm usually down to about 40%, and that's in an area without 5G support, and mostly working from home. The iPhone 13 Pro Max is easily one of the most long-lasting phones on the market, and will rarely, if ever, give you battery anxiety. Now, neither has particularly speedy charging speeds, but they do support power delivery. iPhone can do 20 watt speeds, with Samsung offering 25. Both will get you about 50% refill in roughly half an hour. So there's no real big difference there. So cameras, and it would probably be a bit of an oversimplification to say both of these phones feature similar camera setups. But in theory, or at least basic theory, they do. Except Samsung has an extra camera. Both have primary, ultra-wide, and 3 times telephoto zoom cameras, but the Ultra also features the Periscope 10 times optical zoom. That's kind of its secret weapon that lets you zoom in even closer to your scene without losing a ton of detail. Still, if you push either up to those limits, you won't get as sharp a picture as you will from the primary cameras. It just seems a bit more rough in general. With the primary cameras, both feature similar technologies, so you get stabilization with both, but with different techniques. Samsung stabilizes the lens where Apple has sensor shift tech. It's interesting comparing the cameras though because in some instances they produce very similar results. We did find at times that the iPhone sometimes pushed the contrast a bit higher, particularly noticeable indoors when compared to the Samsung. That resulted in a darker, less natural look. Other times, especially outside, it looked more natural and true to color than Samsung. With greenery and blue skies, we often found Samsung would push the saturation a little bit more, making them seem just a tiny bit hyper-real. However, there was the odd time when the ultra-wide results didn't colour match with the primary, which is unusual for iPhone. The same can be said for Samsung's ultra-wide, which would sometimes wash out some shots, and in macro mode, there was the odd occasion where the iPhone would completely blow out highlights compared to Samsung. And there's that camera switching issue that Apple is rolling out a fix for, so if you get close to a subject, it starts to switch between cameras and makes it really hard to frame your shot. In lower light shots, they both do fine, although they take quite a different approach to temperature. We weren't quite prepared for the differences in night mode, so indoors in a room with a smart bulb set to night mode where it goes dim and warm, Samsung's approach was to white balance it and get the colours looking correct, as if it was a white light on them iPhone took the complete opposite approach, over-egging the warmth and making it seem bright red. Otherwise, in night mode, we found that all three cameras, Samsung's approach was softer and more natural than iPhone, which seemed to boost the contrast a bit too much, perhaps in an effort to make the image feel sharper. It's safe to say it wasn't an entirely consistent experience. Both can shoot slow-mo, and from a video perspective, iPhone has a trick called cinematic mode, which introduces a relatively natural background blur, and then slowly pulls focus when you move to point the camera at something else. It works well with static shots that are visually well-defined, but not so well when you're dealing with lots of moving people. And it shoots at a lower resolution. Still, the end result is still nicer than shooting in regular video mode and manually tapping to focus on an object in the background. Now I always feel like Apple's camera is easy to use, with fewer additional menus, and in the past, the iPhone has always been quite consistent in its approach to how images turn out, but this year, something's gone a bit funny. Samsung does sure love to add in lots of different shooting options, which again, might suit you down to the ground, but for others, it might feel a bit too complicated. Now at the end of the day, whichever one you go for, you will get a generally great camera system. But with the iPhone's inconsistency at the moment, I'd say if, as things stand right now, you want the best camera, particularly for photos, the S21 is going to be the better camera here. There is software and ecosystem to consider too, but both are strong here. Samsung has the likes of the new Galaxy Watch 4, which is a great everyday smartwatch and fitness tracker with contactless payments. It's similar to Apple Watch in a lot of ways. It also has smart tag object trackers like Apple has AirTags, and there's a few different models of Galaxy Buds where Apple has AirPods and Beats. Now in the end, really, whichever one of these you go for is going to be a great device. Apple offers, we think, the better display, performance and battery, where Samsung trumps it at the moment in the camera department, at least based on our experience. There really isn't a lot in it though, because nearly all of the differences are very minor. 
I've been Cam and Matt Cam Bunton on social media if you want to find me on there. If you did like this video, please do leave a thumbs up, subscribe and tap the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any more. And I'll see you again in the next one. Bye for now.